call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here in the John Hope Franklin Center today with Professor Eduardo Bonilla Silver, who's the author of many books, but most importantly, the author of the classic Racism Without Races, Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in America, now in its fourth edition. And so let's start here. I imagine you got to be working on a fifth edition right now. Um, given everything that's going on in this country, where you could argue that we're seeing now the more public expression of state-sanctioned violence against black bodies than any time than we may have seen since Jim Crow. Um, what the hell is going on? Well, interestingly, I have argued somewhat in the opposite uh, uh, perspective that the discrimination of the post-civil rights era tends to be of the killing me softly Variety. Right. Then now you see it, now you don't. <laughs> that you go to a store and may I help you, may I help you, may right. I help you. But in that argument that I made some 20 years ago, I also stipulated that the state, in this case, police brutality, you know, the police departments across the nation, were, after Jim Crow sort of slowly died, the police departments were given the task of disciplining poor mm -hmm. folks of color. Yeah? And which was somewhat easy because of segregation, yeah? And it was invisible, so this is not, you and I know that police brutality is not a new it's development. New it has been with us for 40, 50 years. And the rates have been more or less the same. The revolution, I think, is cell phones, yeah? And now we have videos, and that is why you see all these uh, uh, states trying to control the idea of videotaping and saying that you cannot video unless you are 100 feet away, which right. means that you won't see the Say details, anything. you know. So, so, but the beauty is that then now, after, last time I was here, I was critical of uh, Obama and the uh, Obama <laughs> bots who were just, <laughs> Obama is perfect, he cannot do anything wrong. So I think the mood in the, in the nation has changed dramatically, particularly in black America, also among Latinos. So we support the brother, but we no longer trust that he's going to deliver on us. So when he, for example, after Ferguson, yeah. called on black activists, let's talk, right. and his idea was, I hear you, but can you keep it together? Right. Can you stop acting irrationally? Right. They told him, no, because irrational behavior is the only rational way that we, we can express our concerns. Whenever we act rationally, that is, Right. following the dictates of the law, waiting for the courts to deliver on us. The courts have shown their colors. Right. And it's a right. white color. Right. Right. That's what so the after Trey case after, right. after right. Trayvon Martin, etc. So folks are in a understandably an angry mood. Um, and again, two, three years ago when we spoke, I was pessimistic <laughs> about the future. <laughs> there was no movement uh, right. out there. Uh, folks were still thinking that uh, organizing for Obama was a social movement. Yeah? Right, right. So I was best optimistic. Now I'm optimistic because this Ferguson thing has legs. And we all saw the video yesterday or the last few days of the brother in, in, Baltimore. in Baltimore. And people are still in the streets in Ferguson, in Baltimore, in South Carolina. And soon, <laughs> I'm telling you, soon in Durham, North Carolina. Because police brutality is not just an isolated incident that happens in those southern specific, happens across the nation. And then once in a, in a while, it ends up in someone being murdered. But after the person is killed, we learn, oh, by the way, this is a pattern. Right. So we learned uh, this morning that the Baltimore uh, city had paid $6 million in 100 different cases of police brutality in the last four years. So, so it's systematic pattern. It's not a problem of bad apples. It's a problem of uh, the apple tree is rotten and we may need to remove the entire tree. So let's talk about this for a second, right? Because you would think that if you're a municipality, right, and particularly one like Baltimore, right? You know, Baltimore's not a rich city, you know, by any stretch of imagination. If you're paying out all this money for police brutality cases, you would think a light would go off someplace. <laughs> that, you know, in order for us to be, you know, just more economically smart, you know, we need to rein this activity in. You know, 
how does these things not go together, right? How is one hand not thinking what the other hand is doing in, in this context? Well, in part, it's again going back to what was the task of police departments right. in the last 40 years. So therefore, the broken windows, right? This idea of broken it, windows, right? Control, 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 discipline, discipline, over patrol, over patrol. And the brutality was just sort of one element of the extreme policing that communities of color, brown and black, have experienced over the last 40, 50 years. But you are right, and in the case of, of, of uh, Baltimore, the important thing that we need to understand is the mayor is black, yes. the chief of police is black, <laughs> and a simplistic understanding of racism would suggest, therefore, race has no matter, matter no, it's right. no business on this matter. This is just a random event. Well, first, it wasn't random. We have the systematic data. Secondly, now we know that uh, black police officers and this peculiar position that they, on the one hand, it is not that they don't experience discrimination from other police officers, white police officers, or in the streets of America. They do. But at the same time, they're indoctrinated in the uh, pattern of vi uh, vigilance and, and control of black bodies. So they have this <laughs> uh, double consciousness, if you, <laughs> if you will, of on the one hand, they know that they face racial profiling and discrimination, sometimes even from their own brothers yeah. and sisters yeah. in the police force, right. but they still do it. And one case that shocked me, and I don't know why we haven't collectively discussed this in a more meaningful way, was a South Carolina case where we saw the video and we failed to recognize the that black the black cop <laughs> who <laughs> saw <laughs> right. or should have seen <laughs> or is covering up for his white, white brother brothers, right. because he must have seen the activity and definitely he saw right. the white officer going, picking right. the gun and throwing it uh, uh, in the body of, 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 uh, of um, Walker. What's his last name? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, but that also speaks to how simplistic we think about race in this country, right? Race is always just black and white, right? We don't see the way that even black bodies, black agents Can are working as agents of the state, you know, in terms of controlling, right? And, and when you talk about a city like Baltimore. And politics too. And politics, right? Clarence Thomas should have. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when you look at a city like Baltimore, I mean, part of the reason why you elect a black mayor and have a, a black police chief, because you need those black folks to have that same element of control over black bodies. You know, that wouldn't work, right? A white mayor in, in, you know, in Baltimore doesn't work the same way, right? A white mayor in Oakland <laughs> doesn't work the same way. So a white need, mayor in Detroit doesn't work the same so way. So my contention is that in this post-civil rights era, you can get false positives, yeah. meaning <laughs> folks that uh, have the right color but the wrong politics, and therefore we need to move beyond epidermic uh, notions of race to political notions of race. So I want people who have the right politics, yeah. the right color of the politics, right, and the right color of the skin. Because sometimes, often, you get these neo mulattos, or you get a dark-skinned brother, yeah, <laughs> uh, in the Supreme Court, who then has done, and, and I remember, you and I probably remember, yes, yes. during that case, how the NAACP took a long, a sweet long time to make a decision about whether to object right. or not to Clarence right. Thomas. They ended up objecting, but too late, yeah? Right. And the argument, now we have people sort of confiding what was the discussion. The discussion was, he's black, so he'll turn. Right. How is that working for oh, us? Right, as a right, people? No, 25 yeah, years yeah, later. 25 right. years, he hasn't <laughs> turned, you know. And the argument we had is like, you know, on top of everything, in terms of his conservative politics, he definitely wasn't qualified because he hasn't said anything. Yeah. He just follows whatever his mentors in the Supreme Court uh, say or do, and then he just says yes. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here joined today by sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva, sociologist here, former chair of the sociology department here at Duke University, the author of the classic Racism Without Racist, now in its fourth edition, and I'm sure he's readily preparing a fifth edition, given everything that's going on in the U.S. now. Have you been surprised? Uh, well, let me not even ask it that way, right? If you're President Obama um, and Ferguson pops off, Trayvon pops off, all this stuff is going on. You know, are you waking up one morning going like, what the hell just happened, right? Because I'm sure of all the things he could imagine that would have come during the course of his presidency, he didn't see this coming, right? And, and there's almost some poetic justice to it, right? Because, you know, his presidency starts, you know, with a police officer arresting Skip Gates in his house. <laughs> Right, and, and the president comes about as hard as he had ever come on race. He gets spanked for it, right? He spanks Eric Garner for talking publicly about it, and then he kind of backs away. And, but now he's in a position where he can't. 
right? In some ways, he has to deal with what ultimately will be the defining crisis, I think, of his presidency. Uh, and that is the tragedy, yeah, that, uh, so you know that in my, in my uh, last versions of the book, I took Obama on and <laughs> called him <laughs> neoliberal, that on race matters he was right. not going to right. Right. do much, and I claimed that also on international matters he wasn't going to do much. So now in his sixth year, he's doing a few things on Cuba, et cetera, and you know, we're happy about that, and he's trying uh, uh, delicately to deal with the situation in Israel. Right. But on race, he has been consistent. Right. He has not touched that, <laughs> uh, you're right, only once, yeah? Right. When he made that. Except my brother's keeper, right, which is. Which is, which is then a problematic uh, <laughs> sexist right. initiative, yeah? Right. W in which people, white folks, don't mind that uh, uh, perspective because it reinforces the notion of black men need discipline. Right. They need uh, to be told. He's doing the same thing that the police officers are doing in the hood. In right? the Function hood. In the same uh, way. The right. same policing. Let me tell you, you need values. <laughs> you need to pull your pants <laughs> up, etc. <laughs> Get a job. Learn how to speak proper English, etc. So, so that is the interesting thing that now, honestly, in a sense, he could be a free man of color. Yeah. Right. He's not running for anything again. Right. So he could have go come stronger. He, could, he should have gone to Ferguson. And after Eric Holder gave him the best way of doing it, it's like, hey man, this department is corrupted. We need to close this thing right, down. Right. He could have then taken a stronger position rather than doing what he did, which was meeting with activists behind closed doors, doors right. which backfired because he thought he was going to somehow control them and use his charm. Right. And again, three, four years ago, perhaps that would have worked. No more. So okay. young activists are no longer in the mood of, well, he's my president, he's black, he ultimately is on my side. They are like, ah, we need to push, and if you're not doing anything, then history has, you know, uh, move on, and we don't care. Have you been surprised, you know, you've been on these college campuses as long as I have. I, I can't remember this level of energy from young folks really since the anti-apartheid movement of the 80s, right? I mean, and that's the kind of stuff that kind of you know, brought me to maturity in terms of some sort of political sophistication about what was going the on. 1980s, in the 1980s, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there was that moment, of course, with Rodney King. You know, and and not surprisingly, around police brutality, right? The, really, the beginning of the digital era, right? You know, the, the the holiday video that shoots all of this and it changed the game for a little while, mm -hmm. right? Now everybody has handheld stuff and it's changing the game. But have you been surprised by almost the level of sophistication? that young folks have deployed, not only just being in the streets, but the way they're using social media, the way they're learning how to manipulate mainstream media, right? That great scene where Talib Kweli is being interviewed by Don Lemon, you know, live on CNN, and he pulls Don Lemon's coat, you know, why, why are you functioning the way that you do, mm -hmm. right? You know, to the detriment, right, of, of what we're trying to do in terms of, of, you know, saving black lives. Well, the first thing is that let's be humble and acknowledge our extreme limitations because none of us predicted this. Right. So again, right. I, right. I admit, right. I failed to predict this, in part because social movements are extremely hard right. to, to predict. predict. Yeah? Right. So, so sociologists have made a, a, a career out of trying to explain social movements, except that we tend to do it ex post facto. Yeah. After the movement happens, we have beautiful explanations, but the test of civilization is predictive. And in part because we tend to get, the, get disconnected, we become inorganic intellectuals, then we're not really having the pulse of youth, the pulse of folks. Had we been consistent, we would have, I think that the Trevor Martin was the moment, yeah? yeah. And yeah. the moment, because that was sort of the last chance for America, yeah. the last chance for white America to demonstrate. And what did they do? Well, the outcome of the trial was in the wrong direction, and the opinion polls clearly showed right. two nations, right. one black, one white. And the black nation is also a brown nation because blacks and Latinos saw eye to eye in a case that could have been viewed as a divisive case, right. because after all, George was <laughs> Jorge right. Zimmerman. Right. And I don't know, the, I'm assuming that most of the viewers don't know. Right. But he appeared in Telemundo and in all Univision, and his Spanish is actually quite good. And interestingly, <laughs> wow. in the interviews in Spanish, he looked better than in the interviews in, in English, English, where he sounded callous, etc. Yeah. But in the Spanish, he, he sounded That's almost humble, you know. But still, folks didn't believe him, yeah? yeah. So he, they, they were like, you are the issue. 
and you have it, all this horrific <laughs> record of abuse, abusing women, etc. So you should be incarcerated for something, you know. <laughs> so hopefully for murder, but if not, at right. least for all the other uh, things you have done uh, in your life. When we go back and look at this moment again, um, Eric Garner in New York, when we talk about Ferguson, now we're looking at North Charleston. You know, one of the things that's been really surprising is that, you know, these aren't necessarily big cities, right? We expect this from LA. We expect this from New, New York, York, right? Chicago, right? You know, the fact that it's small town America, right? And of course, one of the things that's come out in all of this, Ferguson being a perfect example, are the ways that these municipalities are over-policing, right, to generate revenue. Right, and so it's almost like some sort of neo-slavery moment, right, it where, is. you know, you're actually using black bodies three years ago to generate revenue, but now you're incarcerating black bodies, right? And, and you know, there's a larger infrastructure of that, right? Prison industrial complex, you're putting people to work, <laughs> right, to manage these black and brown bodies in prisons, but now you're actually over-incarcerating on the ground. And one of the things I found was, you know, but ter ter terrifically ironic, the number of black folks who signed off on helping municipalities pass legislation to criminalize sagging, <laughs> right? I don't like looking at your ass, your pants are hanging, right? So I'm gonna allow this municipality to write you a $250 fine. These folks are actually contributing to this larger system, right, of over-incarceration, right? So it's this weird part where our political goals are actually being undermined by some sort of r ridiculous idea around respectability. The, middle, the black middle class, has, you know. <laughs> so now, something that we knew from before, which is that the black community is divided by classes, yeah? Right. So we, we parade as we are one, but we are internally divided. And the black elite, as Manny Marable used to call it, so the middle class and the, the small segment of the bourgeoisie, the black bourgeoisie, their dream has always been, how can I be not black? <laughs> how can I not be or, associated? Or, or not be black or like not those be black, black like, like those, those people. Black yeah? people. Right. So they have been strong in pushing the poison responsibility for right. Right. hundreds of years. Now they can associate and actually get paid Right. For working with what we used to call the man right. in the 60s. But I think it's going to ultimately backfire because of this social movement. Now, the other thing that we need to understand that why these small municipalities is that we uh, move in the early part of the 20th century north to these big cities. We're now in this return migration, going right. to these smaller cities. Right. Uh, things are really hard, and it's really hard to survive New York, right. Boston, right. etc. Too right. expensive. It's too ex right. So in a, we end up sort of in these smaller towns, yeah? And in these smaller towns, with the fiscal crisis of the state, a good, easy way of getting money is doing all these rackets. Right. So I live in, in, in Texas for seven years. <laughs> and, in, a, <laughs> and in a lot of the cities, particularly people don't know Texas, they assume it's just a a Latino Anglo space. Yeah. Well, actually, the eastern part of Texas is mostly black life. Right, right, and right, in those right. small towns, the game in town was they stop either a Latino or an African American with the ghetto mobile, yeah? yeah? And then they tell them, okay, so this is the deal. We're going to give you this fine, and you have to come next week, and that will cost you X number of dollars. But if you allow me to confiscate the, the car, that's it. So they kept confiscating cars, you know, get them movies. They're not like, right. you know, but right. 2,000 here, right. 2,000 there, right. 1,000 here, 1,000 there. That's real money. So that is the way that the smaller municipalities was, yeah. were working at, until finally people, the, the few people who were able to, to push back, to push back yeah. and to get uh, Johnny Cochran. Yeah, we need him back. <laughs> so so uh, legal representation and then the discovery is that they were doing this all over the place. They were also planting in Texas. Uh, drugs in, in and, and following literally arresting every black person in, in a town right. of the, what was the name to tulip or something like yeah. that there was a town where they did that and almost every black person was arrested or stopped for suspicion of right. uh, having cocaine and they would force them to plea bargain and right, they right. were forced to the great film american violent talks about how you know folks are caught in between a rock and a hard place and it is invisible to the larger society that is what right. i think is still works right. in this killing me softly, right, the because moment, most right. of us don't know. We're unaware, including us, folks of right, color, yeah? Right, right. So we learn from the news, but 
because it's extremely poor people and we members of the black middle class <laughs> are separated. Right, right. We are really <laughs> far from, from these yeah. realities. So now again, the speed of the communication going back to the, to the dexterity of young folks is that they are connecting dots. Right. And these stories that used to take a long time to circulate are now circulating fast and furious. Yeah. And it's then producing the intended effect, which is people need to be angry. It's time for us to be, yeah, angry, to be angry and not take, I mean, why should we take another uh, uh, murder? Why should we be like, oh my goodness, again and again? We right. should be basically right. no more. That should be the new right. slogan. So forget about no justice, no peace. It's no more. You're watching Left to Black. We're here with Duke University sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva. Let's come closer to home. Um, we're on a campus in which uh, there have been at least two recent events that we know of. One was the hanging of a noose. Um, the leadership of the university blessed their heart, um, had a kind of kumbaya moment, <laughs> you know, with the campus and, and, and for lack of a better way to describe it, our, our white peers and students had a moment to get all up in their feelings about what was happening, you know, to, to or potentially happening to black folks and black students on campus. But in what ways do you think the university really turns a blind eye to what's happening outside the walls of the campus, which black and brown students always bring to campus with them, right? This Black Lives Matter stuff, Ferguson, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, um, Renisha McBride, I mean, black students are bringing all of that on campus with them, and the university has a deaf ear to that, right? It does not pay any attention to that. Then a news shows up, uh -oh. and, and they're like, why are y'all upset, right? Because, you know, this is the shit that we deal with, right? And it's interesting that suddenly everybody, like, you know, the new provost is talking about microaggressions, right? So someone's provided her with the language to try to navigate all this kind of stuff. But again, for most black students, right, and brown students, this is a lived reality that the university does, uh, really uh, doesn't uh, care about. And that's what the important thing. We have to begin as the king used to say in Alice in Wonderland, let's begin at the beginning. The beginning is that this university, like most universities in the nation, are HWCUs, historically white college and university, right. with a certain demography, tradition, uh, ecology, symbols. I mean, right. how many times you and I go and give speeches in this uh, president right. room, right. and you look around, and it's like, Oh, right. quite, quite, quite. oh, it looks like right. the clan room. Right. And then you immediately begin your presentation. <laughs> and you got to be quick. Right. Yep. Right. You got to be quick. Move on. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that is the, the, the first uh, part of the mystery of why these isolated incidents right. keep happening again and again and again. And again, uh, the, the president made a comment, and uh, we, we were asked to attend this event, uh, and many, many, many Duke students and faculty attended. Were, uh, that yeah. was. Uh, interesting I thought but his commentary was erratic because he ultimately said this is not us this is an anomaly <laughs> and for those of us who have been here for a while we know that the climate of racial hostility yeah that includes what the provost called the microaggressions right yeah and for you and I although we definitely don't like seeing nooses hanging on any tree in our campus we also know that the micro nooses that we experience all right. the time from faculty, from students, challenging our presence in the campus, challenging <laughs> Go, our knowledge. Going to Harris Teeter to buy some groceries. Go, <laughs> yes, et cetera. <laughs> so dealing with the, uh, and I said this in a, in a talk, and two or three white professors then challenged me at the end. I said, you know what, let me give you an example of the whiteness of this campus. You never see me at night in this universe. Right. And then they are like, why? And like, because this place, <laughs> which allows me sort of, during the day, at night, it turns into quasi-clan territory. Yeah. And if it's a Friday <laughs> with alcohol involved, right. then worse. Right. And if I go by certain areas, the fraternity row, et cetera, it's even worse, yeah? Right. So, it, so is this the university is a sundown town. It's a right. sundown town. Right. That is the feeling. <laughs> but it's interesting that then my, my white colleagues cannot understand. Some of the women say, well, I feel you, because right. exactly the same thing right. with me. At night, I feel unsafe. I said, exactly the way that we feel. And we feel unsafe from students, right. from some faculty who then, right. and right. during the right. day, give us some right. kudos, and at night, like, who is this dark Don't know person? whether or not we can trust law and enforcement the campus on campus and or the, off campus. Outside, and the campus police constantly 
May I see your ID? I'm like, for what? <laughs> Who are you? Well, I'm a professor here. Professor, you don't look or sound like a professor. I'm like, you, you don't, you don't right. look like an idiot, but you are behaving like one. <laughs> so I, if, I want, if you want my ID, actually, that's a dream. I never do that right. because I don't, don't want to die in a silly way. Right. Yeah? Right. I will contest right. later right. on the, right. the, the incident. Right. But if I were to do something like that, I would be the next Eric Garner. Yeah? Right. So he, he, he disobeyed an order. I mean, th think about this. Uh, this morning I was just mad, furious. And again, we, we have the right to be mad. This young kid killed in Baltimore, mm -hmm. ran. So we are literally collectively on the run. We are right. afraid of the police, yeah? Okay. So yeah. what did he have? A freaking pocket knife. Right. A, a rap sheet that according to the police are like, oh, this is nothing. Right. Yeah? And he's afraid of the police. Right, and, and that's the thing, because you know what I mean? It's like, well, why would he run? Why wouldn't he run, right? The rational thing to do is actually to run because we've already seen, we have seen the, what know. happens when you don't run, right? Eric Garner couldn't run. <laughs> I mean, just physically, you know, he wasn't going to go run down the block, right? So, you know, staying there doesn't save you, right? Yes. You know, actually listening to the police and following their directions doesn't necessarily save you. So, therefore, <laughs> that is the quandary. Right. And that's why we have to then throw the ball back to the white side and say, analyze that. All these young kids running away from the police, scared. And if you were to talk systematically, I have one of my students doing a project in New York. Black and brown youth in New York are, rightly so, afraid right. of the police. Right. So whenever a police officer comes, and occasionally they may have marijuana, or they may not. I had a, a friend who, who was just urinating in public. Okay, that is a misdemeanor, yeah. little stuff. Yeah. What did he do when the police came? Run away, right. and then the case became much bigger. Right. But it is because of this continuous violence, over policing, and the commentary that the larger community, white folks, don't right. don't right. know right. is the hostility, the kind of of a brutality, verbal abuse that all these youth have been submitted since they are little kids, you know, yeah. in the streets of uh, in the mean streets of America. You mentioned uh, what's gonna potentially happen in a city like Durham, right? So Durham's going through this transformation, right? A historically black city that now is dealing with this influx of New York money, right? You know, folks who couldn't, who are out, uh, you know, they can't live in New York. New York's too expensive. They can move down to, to Durham, you know, get a 2,000 square foot. Urban you know, renewal or, 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 or Negro right, removal. You, <laughs> know, or, you know, urban, you know, get their nice little flat 2,000 square feet and still have enough money to either open up an art gallery or a restaurant, right? And so suddenly when you walk in downtown Durham on a Friday night, right, downtown Durham looks a little different, right? The five points looks a little different. And so now you have a police department that now is now policing to protect whiteness in the context of a city like Durham that has no real experience like that, <laughs> with that. Um, and so I imagine everything that we've seen the last four or five years are, are only going to get worse because of those kinds of tensions. Absolutely. And I, again, this, is, this has happened in the last 10 years. So when I came 10 years ago, all my colleagues, I would tell them, hey, there is this restaurant downtown. They are like, you go, go downtown. You, you go downtown. <laughs> oh, it is not safe. I'm like, actually, it is safe. I, it's nice. I do have problems going to the white neighborhoods. Then, you know, so I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, Walking if, past Duke Garden, if, I, <laughs> if I go to a white neighborhood, then the, you guys call the police on me. Yeah. But anyway, so you are right. And the prediction is that as, as the downtown is being uh, renovated and right. gentrified, the policing is going to intensify. And I, you and I probably concur that most likely the things that we saw with Eric Garner may happen in our town. And it's time for us to then begin getting organized, yeah. be begin objecting to this kind of one-sided uh, gentrification right. without any concern about uh, black lives, yeah? Right. Right. economic lives, right. black social lives. Yeah? Right. So the space is supposed to be public. Why wouldn't a, a, a free person of color, a free right. American, right. be able to enjoy right. the public space? Just sit on a bench. Sit on <laughs> a bench. bench. Right. But now that's going to be criminalized. People are going to be asked, what are you doing here? I'm, like, right. I'm sitting. Right. So you cannot because you're not sponsoring. Sponsoring what? <laughs> I'm a citizen. I can sit wherever I want. And, and that's where, you know, the Duke piece comes interesting also, right? Because obviously Duke has an investment in this, right? It's almost an invisible partner. Yeah. Right, but Duke clearly has an investment in this, right? And then when you look at, you know, who works at Duke, and so we always think about Duke as this kind of white university, right? But, you know, we're not thinking about the folks who work in the dining halls, folks who work in the dorms, 
clerical staff, you know, folks who are cleaning our offices when we're not there. And I always thought it was really interesting when the news thing went down, right? And of course, the message goes out to the students because, you know, they're the pipeline to the money here. Um, if you're working in the dining hall or someplace like that, you know, there's a noose that was hung in your place of employment, right? And this is for working class black folks, you know, who were four, the or ones five, four or five generations who, who have survived Jim Crow in places like Dorm, you know, North Carolina, to wake up one morning, you know, 50 years later, there's a noose in your place of employment. And the university doesn't have any language to respond to that, right? It doesn't even recognize it, right? Let alone have language to respond to it. Yeah, and, and the mo I mean, uh, to add uh, complexity to the matter, one thing that I think we collectively, we folks of color, did wrong in this moment was, so the news incident could have been a catalyst for, a, for larger social action. Absolutely. Yeah? So we were irritated, and we did a few things for two, three days. <laughs> the Duke basketball team won. <laughs> <laughs> Semester is ending. <laughs> And I am afraid that this horrific incident will become right, just right. another isolated right. incident. Next semester begins, senior students out, new students come in, right. come in dealing with right. the and issues. And that's how that universities manage this, right? And that's how they manage crisis. And, right. and that is why the, the, the only language that uh, uh, universities understand is the language of uh, Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And it is creating crisis in public relations. So we fail in not matching the moment. If someone is hanging a noose, we need to fight back, take buildings, do what the students are doing at the University of Michigan. Yeah. Time for us to take building, buildings, time for us to take, be, be mad. Otherwise, as you mentioned, so the administration, they are, they are excellent and extraordinary at meeting, asking for a meeting, let's meet, right. and let's meet again. That they are paid to, for, for, right. for, to meet. <laughs> we cannot afford to meet. meet we should right. be, I don't need to meet. Right. I know what happened. What are you going to do? And we want A, B, C, D, E, F, G. On the, and the fact of whiteness, that's one of the problems that I thought in terms of the demands of the students. So if this is an HWCU, the policies that we need need to be radical, even revolutionary policies to try to de-whiten this institution yeah. and make it a truly multicultural right. space. That will in, in involve not just changing the demography in terms of faculty and right. student body, but also administration, uh, retooling. So our colleagues need to be retrained, yeah? yeah. Because Absolutely. the problem of microaggressions, yeah. right. the, the stuff that you and I have gotten from colleagues right. that they don't even know, what did I do? I'm like, right. well, right. don't you remember that you said that my, you said that you do research and that I do me search. Right. What, how do you think, think I, I feel? feel. Right. How do you think I feel when you basically tell me that all my work is nonsense right. and you are the greatest thing after white right. bread? Right. Pun intended. I mean, so, so the retooling of this universe is to make it a multicultural one and remove the W from the HWCU. That should be the immediate task. And that can be done. University will say, well, si since racism is na a national problem, we cannot do anything until the nation changes. And that is baloney. Yeah. Universities claim to be repositories of what is good in society, agents of difference and change. They can begin a radical transformation that could ultimately also help society see we can reimagine ourselves. We can reinvent ourselves. Nothing short of that will do it at this stage. Bringing one or two faculty of color will not do much, as you know. Right. We bring two, we lose one. Right. We lose one, we, we, we bring two. Right. It, it, that doesn't change anything. You had, it's, it's a moment for us to think uh, and new things and to think big. We have been yeah. thinking small right. in the last 30 years, and it's time for us to say, you know what? We have nothing to lose right. at this stage. Let's yeah. try to retool the entire place. No more of these little things. We want huge ideas. Yeah. We've been joined today by Professor Eduardo Bonilla Silva, uh, Professor of Sociology in the Department of Sociology here at Duke University, the author of the classic text, Racism Without Racist, now in its fourth edition, published in 2013. Thanks for joining us today, Eduardo. Thank you for inviting me. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.